peace, family. How's everyone doing this evening? I hope well, or I trust that you are doing well, or moving towards doing well. I am Haru Hassan Anu, and you are listening to Foundational Fridays on Enlightenment and Transformation. Well, we're now a few days away, two days away from our new class semester, and there are many excited people who have reached out to me and um, have some very beautiful transmissions, you know, as well as questions, but there's a lot of excitement around it. And that's a wonderful thing. You know, it's wonderful that uh, people are excited about learning and entering into a new experience uh, without a whole lot of fear and trepidation. Uh, Some of the questions that have come in have been geared around people wanting to really know what would be required of them in terms of being a part of the Institute and learning experience. And it's really important that people understand with my learning or teaching style more so, um, I don't expect any form of initiation from any student. Uh, I don't really feel that learning necessarily comes through initiation Though I'm not downing initiation, but uh, my teaching style is different when it comes to that. So, you know, all that's really expected of you is that you just maintain an open mind, you know, and and an open heart when it really comes to taking in the information. And really importantly, not trying to define it based on anything that you previously learned before. Because if you do that, you're not going to get what you're supposed to get. And we've already had some instances of that people have reached out and asked those questions and kind of made certain assumptions about what it would be. And um, I can tell you that as far as even my experience and I've, I have a decent amount in various systems of being around various people and even in various religions, uh, I have not seen anything like the Anu spiritual training system. Now it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I'm sure it does somewhere. I just haven't encountered it. Uh, it's just nothing new under the sun. And some truth to that, although that's not totally true. But, um, you know, I'm just doing something that I think is unique in this time and season. Uh, but there have been unique things. There's unique things coming every generation. And sometimes they're almost identical. We we repeat a lot of technology, you know. So I will never stand up and have all new and improved you know, method that no one is come up with. The, the strongest and the best method of your learning is really just hard work and dedication. You know, there's really no shortcut to becoming that priest or priestess that you desire to be. There are people who will make you think that there are shortcuts. They will charge you certain amounts of money for you to take on certain titles. And, um, You'll find out ultimately when you get around people who have actually put the work in and who are hardcore about what they're doing, you realize you don't have anything but, you know, less money in your bank account. Uh, So really the solution is putting the work in. And from that, you will gain a divine title. You know, you don't need anyone to stand over you and say, you are now this based on what you just put in their pocket. You know, communal recognition is is beautiful and it's wonderful if it's based on actual work that you've put in. So the learning system that that I've designed that will be initiating November 11th, that's 11-11, that's this Sunday, uh, and the class will be available for register at 11-11 a.m., okay? So it will be available November 11th, 2012. And you will be able to register and join and pay for the class November, I'm sorry, at 11, 11 a.m. So obviously you see your brothers moving with this 11 vibration. And I'm going to do a show on that uh, as far as the the number 11 and a couple other numbers that are key for us to pay attention to um, in this, this season, this 2012 season, when there's so many things that are going on right now. Of course, uh we got hit with some some snow recently. It wasn't really a blizzard, you know. Um, 
lot of hype, but uh, it did affect some of the um, Wi-Fi uh, transmission. And pri- prior to that, of course, you know that we had the uh, power outage out this way. Many people are still without power. They've even uh, in- instituted martial law in certain parts of the state. And um, I would say it's probably even in- instituted in more parts than have even, even that have even been acknowledged. So on to other things. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful time right now to get into your spiritual work because it's such a mass awakening uh, of people who are bringing different ideas and things forth. And you know, I know a lot of you have sent me emails asking different questions, and I haven't gotten through all of them. Uh, I've been working on that. Uh, one in particular that I, I looked at the other day uh, from a, a young woman kind of mirrored some of the questions that I've received in the past and some that I even have waiting now in the queue. And it was uh, a question about personal shrine. Uh, well, I shouldn't say personal because it was her ancestral as well as her personal shrine. And I'm just going to answer some of it now. Let me just uh, get it in front of me. But this young woman had asked um, basically one of the first things, and this comes up a lot. She said her shrine is on a multi-level coffee table, you know, so it's not just one flat shrine, but it's basically like shelves, you know, or multi-level either way, Um, which I actually prefer. I like that because you can actually put more and less space. So I like shrines that you step up type of um, format. So that's that's perfectly fine. I, I actually prefer it because it also implants something into your psyche when you see the steps that you're ascending up to something, like ascending up to a throne. I like shrines that are lower because you have to bow or get down on your knees to work with them, a service, which obviously is a humbling of your physical uh, body, which is important for you to keep in mind when you're doing spiritual work, the physical body being the lesser part of you, not the wicked part, not the less divine part, but just the smaller part. So, you know, having to bend down to a shrine is wonderful. Uh, the multi laid is fine. One of the things she asked about was the fact that it had a glass top uh, and there's no cloths on it. That's perfectly fine, too. You know, you don't have to use cloths. Uh, most of the time we do, and in some traditions, uh, flags are used, but uh, you don't necessarily have to use a cloth. You can use a plain surface. You could just have wood. You could use plywood or two by fours. I've set up shrines like that before where it was just wood. Um, another preference of mine, you know, um, but hers is just glass. That's cool. You know, really for me in terms of surfaces with shrines, what I prefer to see is anything that's not artificial. Uh, anything that has uh, a greater vibration to it because it has some type of organic substance working within it, as opposed to seeing things, uh, polyester, plastic, styrofoam on your shrine. Now, if you have those, those are fine. Sometimes we'll have like plastic statues and stuff because ultimately, again, (laughs) none of it's really real anyway. It's all really for something to trigger something into your psyche. But um, certain objects have more OGG or what we'll say electromagnetic energy than others. So things that are of an organic nature have actually more electromagnetic energy or what you would also call ashe. They have more ashe than things that are inorganic. So as far as glass top, that's perfectly fine. Uh, One of the other things that she had wondered about was after reading Grabbing the Root of Divine Power, if her, for her Egum shrine, if they would prefer to be before and if they all want their pictures up there. Okay, well this is there's a couple of ways I can answer this, but I'm gonna give you a I'm gonna give you a teacher's answer. <laughs> all right. Uh also in grasping the root of divine power, there's a very simple form of divination that I included in there where you can get, you know, your five position uh Agbana or coconut answers. So my suggestion to you on that one is to cast to your egon and ask them. So what you do is you do the Riki or the the um, prayer that's my book for the egon, 
I don't remember what page it's on, but it's you know it's in the outdoor of the press in that section, and go through the whole process like you do of setting you know of doing setting up the OB and and getting ready to do a divination session. They do that, prepare them, and then you just ask them. You know, you ask them, okay, would you like to be here? Would you like this on it? Would you like that on it? Now, ultimately, you should kind of be able. To, sometimes you'll put something on your shrine, and you'll you'll hear like this loud no. You know, go with it. You know, don't start second guessing it. Well, maybe I'm saying no because this one had a fight with that one, or that, uh, or I never really knew this one that well, or you know, they didn't get me a bike for Christmas. Don't really get into all of that. Go with your 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 vibes. Sometimes it'll be that overwhelming no when you kind of know. All right, leave this alone. That's when you start getting exploding candles and stuff falling and catching on fire and all that because you ignore that no you know but one way that you can be sure and when you do it you won't really have to worry later about it is just to cast on it and trust the cast once you cast on it you're casting to your ego and they're telling you directly yeah we want this no we and you find out more things and it's also going to increase your psychic connection to them so just by casting to them eventually you'll a better idea of how they're thinking and how they're functioning. So you want to just do that as far as that in terms of your pictures and if they want to be on the floor or not, um, just cast them. You know, now one of the things that you had also mentioned um, was that you didn't have a divider between your bed and your jingili, your shrine. That's fine. You know, um, again, in the book I mentioned it's best if you have your sacred space inside the bedroom, which, of course, is also a sacred space, that it would be good if you can cover it uh, in the event that you're having sex in your room. Because sex within itself is a ritual. It creates a lot of spiritual energy, and it actually creates spirits. So if you're not... Uh, spiritually conscious or having sex with someone who's spiritually conscious while you're doing it and you're doing it in front of your shrine, then you could actually be putting energy to things that you don't really want to put energy to. As far as um, the act in front of your ancestors, let's say, because I've heard people speak about that a lot. You know, a lot of houses teach you know, before you go to your shrine, you should be bathed and have your bed on. Uh, you shouldn't have sex, of course, in front of your shrine. You should never be naked in front of your shrine. Um, I don't really necessarily subscribe to those things. I actually prefer nakedness in front of my shrines. I think that's the best way to be uh, because it allows your whole body to become a part of whatever it is that you're doing. And this was a part of what we did indigenously. That's why we didn't have so many clothes. We were able to not only digest the elements and the minerals that were in the air, but we were always able to become a part of the full environmental rituals that were happening all day, every day, just in nature. So you kind of, um, you miss out, you, you know, when when you cover yourself with a bunch of clothes and, you know, and you really create sickness in that way anyway. Your body wasn't really made to be all covered up like that or to constantly be forced to try to recreate a tropical condition. You know, if it's not tropical, it's not tropical. We always put all these layers on. We want to be extra warm and so forth and so on. So um, my suggestion with that is, you know, you could always cast to them again and ask them. They want you to cover it up. They want you to put a divider. Um, if you're consciously having sex and you're, you're, you know, basically doing sex magic, that's perfectly fine. They're your ancestors. They had sex so that you could be here. You know, a lot of these rules come from um, the intrusion and the invasion of religious ideology and dogma into our into our traditional uh, value systems. So we now look at sex like it's something dirty that they've spoken about. So when it comes back around, when we do that Sankofa, we bring that garbage with us and then we, you know, superimpose it over our traditions when it was never there to begin with, you know, so now we say, oh, well, sex is, is lewd, you know, sex is illicit, so it shouldn't be done in front of a strong, and you should come humbly and all of, you know, that's not really real, 
you know, you should bring your real self to your sacred spaces. And you'll find that the more that you do that, the less questions you'll have. You'll you'll be in the know. When you first started getting into, and this is, I'm speaking generally, when you first started getting into your spirituality, you know, you didn't have rules. You probably were just freestyling and doing things that you felt and you thought of, and you found things working for you. And you were coming to a place of knowing. Then when you started getting a little further and in, in, in introducing your own form of spirituality into people is when you started getting shot down. Like you said, you read and it said this, you know, and I said, you could put it in the, that you could put it on a table, you could put it on the floor, either way, but when in doubt, I think it could start on the floor. But that's when you're in doubt. You know, the reality is you weren't in doubt because you already built it and started it off the floor. You know, so um, if that's working for you, go with it. But if you have some type of apprehension now, cast on it. You know, and don't worry about it. If the cast says put it on the floor now, don't feel guilty like, okay, I was doing wrong all this time. You guys wanted to be on the floor, and I deprived of that. And how many blessings did I miss because you weren't on the floor? Don't look at it that way. You know, it's, all right? So that's really the question for that. You also had a question about um, a vase, putting a vase of that someone made for you that is currently living. That's fine. One of the things that I spoke about in Grasping the Root of Divine Power was not putting images of people who were still alive on your jingillis. Um, that's really important. You psychologically, you know that this is a place for people who have crossed over. So you can begin to push that energy of crossing over for a person that you're even subliminally perceiving that's on your shrine. So you really don't want to put images. If a vase makes you feel like, you know, um, that it's it's conjuring thoughts of early demise for that person who made it for you, then by all means take it off. But, you know, uh, most of the things that you're going to have on your shrine are going to be made or developed by somebody who's still present, even if it's a candle. You know, every candle that's on your shrine, you know, didn't come from someone who's now deceased, you know, or even the cloth or that coffee table. So, you know, don't don't really give that too much uh, concern or worry. That's not really as as important uh, as you having things on that shrine. And really what you were talking about, that space for you, that's really an altar. Okay, so, and in the class series, there's a whole section on shrines and altars. And I get into the difference as well as how to set up um your shrines and altars. Now, for those of you who've read Grasping the Root of Divine Power, you should already know at this point how to set up a ancestral uh, altar. I'm sorry, an ancestral shrine. So uh, in the class series, we won't get too deep into ancestral sh um, shrines because you've already done that if you've read the book, which is one of the prerequisites and the strong advisals for beginning the class series is to read the book first. Uh, so that way you'll understand some of the language and the jargon, you know. So as far as, yeah, with the shrines and the altars, you know, it sounds like your setup is good. What I would add to your setup is divination now. Now you need to start really, you know, asking mature questions. When you didn't have a way as far as you perceived of asking what they want, it's fine. But now that you have the tools available to you, it would now be disrespectful to your ancestors to not use them, to just make certain assumptions because of whatever reason. You know, so that's the only ad admonition I would give you in terms of your shrine is to now respect the fact that you have the ability to tap into their voicing and speak to them. So, you know, one of the things that I wanted to make everyone aware of is uh, not only with the classes beginning this Sunday, is that also... Um, We'll be having live video sessions. I think I mentioned that for the classes so that you can ask me some of these questions one-on-one. -on -one. The classes are set up in a way where it's very um, hands-on. There's a lot of activities. And um, I'm going to do a, a video, which should uh, be up soon. Uh, I'm just finishing it up. which could just explain some of the things to keep in mind with the class. But I can tell you now, like, before you ask, make sure that you're in a position where you can give it your all. 
do not skip around on anything either. Everything that I've included in there, I've included it with a certain order for a reason. Um, but give it your proper attention and time. Sometimes I know with uh, spirituality, we have a tendency to jump on things without really giving it our full effort. You know, like someone will say, hey, you know, you really should get this book over here about so-and-so. They really dropped this and it's real interesting. So we'll just order the book or we'll just buy it and it'll sit on the shelf. But we'll feel some level of uh, accomplishment and fulfillment because at least we have the book. Uh, don't do that <laughs> with this class. You know, uh, when you're ready to take the class, take the class. Uh, and when I say ready, when you're when you're in a place where you know, OK, I want to learn some stuff. I want to do some stuff and I want to interact with somebody who knows some stuff who can bring me to the next level. Then take the class. Don't just do it. Because the way the classes are designed is so that it will lead you up to being the awo at some point or the priest or the priestess, you know, not just necessarily knowing some stuff, having a bunch of dead intelligence. So a lot of what the lessons are very, they're very activity driven. So you actually put your hands in, in stuff and you have opportunities to journal and to really think about the experience from beginning to end and how it's slowly changing you and transforming you, which is really the key, which is really what we're trying to get at is, is a full transformation. So with that, you know, like I said, you know, if you're going to get into it, get your full time and energy. Don't um, don't half step on it. You know, if, if you put in a half behind effort, you're going to get half behind results. And whatever vibration, like I told you before, with your rituals, whatever vibration you come in with your ritual, um, the ritual is going to end up so if you come in with a low vibration, you're going to get back more low vibration results. So it's the same thing when you're learning in a class situation. If you come in with low vibe, you get less. Um, also, in terms of me giving, the more you give, the more I give. So what does that mean? The more you share what you're learning and what you know, even amongst your own student cohort, the more you participate, the more I'll give to you. Because I'll see that you have a spirit of humility. And that's just in general. I'm just telling you, you know, as an instructor, uh, no matter what I'm teaching, I always give more to the humble students. And I always give more to the students who are willing to share what it is that they're learning. Because that's really what it's about. You know, um, some people really still hoard information and while we're in the midst of the information age. It doesn't really make sense. You know, I was... Um, Looking at some posts recently um, on a social networking site and putting up like different spells and potions and stuff like that. And they do it regularly. And I know that they're putting up stuff that's just coming out of people's books because I'm familiar with what they're putting up. And they're kind of passing it off as their own. And um, the problem with that, I mean, not only is it plagiarizing, but the problem with that is that you don't necessarily know if that works unless you've tried all those, those spells and potions I, in my spirit. I didn't feel that I just felt that somebody was putting up content, to keep people hooked to their status post, you know? So, um, you want to have an integrative experience, not just an emulated one where you're just copying something. You know, I could give you a bunch of rituals to do and you just shuffle them and shove them in your back pocket and say, okay, I got these. Or you could say, hey, no, I'm going to go out and I'm going to get these done. You know, and with that, I'm going to give a shout out to to my brother in the UK who um, I, I did check out your email. And that's beautiful. He uh, pursued the Ochosi ritual that I gave in the Ochosi broadcast. And he went through the steps in that and then um, had a job interview and did extremely well. Like he, he crushed it. You know, and he even came with with the Achosi colors and, you know, he, he, he did his thing, you know. So um, this is a person now who has an integrative experience. So he doesn't have to necessarily necessarily re-listen to the broadcast in order now to teach somebody about Achosi. He now has his own experience where he can feed it back. He could probably even tell me, hey, you know, I also noticed this when I did that ritual. You know, it was a ritual that I had given in that broadcast. And if you haven't listened to it, go check it out and do the ritual and see how it works for you. You know, and we were dealing with Ochosi 
the uh, in Matalumbo, the, the astral travelers. You know, they're, they're the master astral travelers, and they allow us also to find the root of a of a solution, or root of a root of a challenge, and to get right to it. You know, so that is that Ochosi energy. You know, so you know, congratulations to him, and um, we'll be building on some other stuff that um, you know that you that you sent out to me as well. I have not forgotten you. So, you know, it's it's a good time right now. People are really getting into the magic. They're getting into the work. And um, they're having some beautiful experiences. And that's why I do this. I do this to see everybody grow. You know, it's not really about me so much. You know, I tell some people that, like, I, I for me to get resources, I just got to do magic for that. Like, I can I can do magic and get stuff. You know, but beyond that, I like to actually see when people blossom. Like, I like to sit back and watch people grow, you know, especially when they come initially not knowing much. And then eventually they come to a point where they're standing on their own two feet. That's a beautiful sight. You know, it's it's like watching a flower grow or or watching your child grow. Nothing more beautiful than that. So I'm always appreciative, as I always tell you guys, uh, when you send me in those um, success stories of um, you actually doing the work and seeing results from doing the work. That's a beautiful thing. Uh, Another thing I wanted to put everybody up on, on this Sunday as well, at 5 p.m., I'll be on uh, uh, Mona Block Talk Radio, Mona's Magic, uh, her radio station. I'll put a link, actually, on the description of this show. But if you go to the Facebook page, the Sudulu House page, you'll see um, links to it. Uh, for that show, that'll be at 5 p.m. And um, that's a sister out of the U.K. And uh, she's got a really nice format, which she does with her show. So I'll be on there at 5 p.m. chopping it up and, you know, talking about what we talk about and the things that we do and sharing more information uh, about how we can get on, get in the front of this thing. And when I say this thing, I'm talking about a shift that uh, so many people are excited about. And so many people are terrified about. So uh, that'll be a beautiful thing. Make sure you tune into that again.